Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. My name is Aswani and I'm a student of NUS Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Thank you for being a part of today's You Alive session, a platform that showcases the many outstanding members of the NUS community who are championing causes to make this a better world. Today's program is in three sections. We'll start off with a 10-minute talk by our speaker, Mr. Edward Cha followed by a 10-minute interview with Mr. Viswa Sivan, who is the chairman of the You Alive Organizing Committee. And it will then be followed by a 40-minute question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please make your way down to the microphones placed along the aisles and speak directly into them. This is essential for the online community to be able to hear your question. Please remember to keep your questions short and concise focusing on the why of the speaker's passion rather than the technical details of their work. Thank you for your kind attention and please sit back and enjoy. University. We have a global vision. We recruit students and faculty from around the world. We give them opportunities to learn how to be effective in many cross-cultural settings. And we do this by creating a very diverse environment in NUS. And when people from outside look at the university community, what they see are very rigorously educated individuals who do well in their work. But you know, there are so many universities that are catching up today and we need to look for a differentiating factor. We must have strong heart. Um, we must go beyond just mainly uh, academic excellence. Not what the university does and does well, but what the university stands for. And that is the, the passion of the community. Students, faculty, staff and alumni, the spirit of the explorer. Somebody who is mentally curious, who has got initiative, resourcefulness, willing to break new ground, which requires boldness, uh, and yet is uh, somebody who is uh, prepared to do something different, to make a contribution. NUS needs to be seen as an organization that is the nurturing ground for people with great passion and the will to go out there and make a difference to their society. And that's what underscores you alive university that's alive. Where we have members of the NUS community share their passion and their commitment and their contributions in many diverse fields. To share their achievements, to share what they have gone through in their life with the student and the graduate community. Could have been a student. He, he or she could have been or is a teacher, a faculty. Could even be an employee, a staff member, or most importantly, an alumni. Individuals who have committed themselves to do very interesting and different things in many varied aspects and dimensions of uh, sports, arts, culture, community service, academic work. And what distinguishes them is a great passion that they bring to their work. The speaker, speak for 10 minutes about not so much what he does, but why he does it. What sort of trials and tribulations has he faced? Why does he believe in this? And after that, there will be a question and answer, an interview, a fairly tough interview. Following that, there will be a live question and answer session with an audience comprising about 100 people. You Alive will be in three different dimensions. One in the auditorium, right, in front of a live audience. While that's going on, it will be 
carried live via webcam to the student population on campus. And the students can actually interact live while they're watching it. The third dimension is we're going to be pumping it to linked uh, websites to more than 200 universities, some of the top universities in the world. There's another very important dimension to ULI, and that is it's mainly driven by our alumni. The whole idea is to provoke thought, ignite that latent flame that I believe strongly exists in each one of us. There are many things in life that will catch your eyes, but few will catch your heart. And only when you pursue something that you are passionate about can you achieve greater heights. And to make even more distinctive contributions to the society we live in and to the wider world beyond. You Alive will epitomize that. Passion. Action. Inspiration. You Alive. He once dreamed of being a musician, but instead used music and the arts to make a difference to society. Today, he's the dynamo behind a thriving business with an unshakable social purpose. He is NUS graduate Edward Chia. We scratch beneath the surface to discover the passion that drives him, to create opportunities for local artists and musicians, and to help define who we are. There is something so beautiful about an artist, the ability to perform, the ability to create something out of nothing. And uh, having tried to be a pianist and did not make it, I felt that maybe my role was then to support musicians. Without the artists and musicians, we don't really quite have, we can say that we are a society that has soul. Being a born and bred Singaporean, it is really my calling to actually support the local scene and to bring our musicians beyond Singapore. And that has always been a driving force, and until today, that is still a singular passion and mission of our organisation, to support our Singapore talent. Ladies and gentlemen, Edward Chia. Good evening. Thank you so much for, for spending time. I, I, I was talking to Viswa on Monday, and. I was telling him we are actually competing with Kylie Minogue, who is actually performing at the Indoor Stadium today. Um, but, I'm, but he told me it's a very different crowd. And I said, OK, that would be great. Um, I'm, I'm sure there was some videos. So I, I'm just, I told Viswa I'm not very comfortable at talking about myself. So I'm just going to say a bit of what I do, and then why I do it, and then I'll invite Viswa on stage as well. So can I just have the, my slides on stage? Um, I'm a co-founder and managing director of Timber Group. Uh, the, the company started in 2005, and this year we celebrate our sixth year, six year anniversary. Timber started out as a live music outlet. From six years on, we have diversified into a range of businesses, mainly food and beverage, events and festivals, artist management and education. And when we say education, we are in the music education business. So what really binds everything together is our passion for live music. Uh, we, today we have a portfolio of brands. We, we have a few of those timber, we have Take, Port Moto Milk. But I'm just going to flash through just some pictures. This is our timber live music bars. Within the food and beverage business, we have live music, food and beverage, and we also have the hotel food and beverage businesses. So these are just some snapshots of timber outlets, which are live music outlets. And then we have the hotel outlets. This is our cocktail lounge at Studio M Hotel our Italian cafe, and our beer garden at Student Hotel. So that's our food and beverage business. And we also have music and events. We just completed a beer festival just about two weeks ago. Over, three, over four days, we attracted 28,000 people at our beer festival. A few months ago, we ran Timber Rock and Roots Festival. We featured 
the legendary Bob Dylan at Timber Rock and Roots Festival as well, and that attracted about 12,000 people over two days. We also have our education arm, which I explained just now. We have the Timber Music Academy, and this is something which we are very proud to have. It doesn't make us a lot of money, it doesn't gross a lot of revenue, but this is a key part of our passion. The Music Academy today has about 100 students, but what makes our academy different from other schools is that all of our teachers are actually live performing musicians with us. And if our students are good enough, they get to perform at Timber. So we are the only music school that I dare say, if you are good enough, you get to perform live to an actual live audience because we have the Timber FMV outlets. So all in all, what binds us together is music. Why we started it, it's also because of music. Me and my co-founder, my co-founder was a live musician. He was a blues musician, found a very hard time trying to establish himself in Singapore. And when we came together, we said, I think it's not about just making money, but I think we want to do something for the Singapore music scene. Incidentally, from the business side, we also carve ourselves a very unique niche. Business landscape in Singapore today is so competitive. If you don't find our niche, we cannot thrive, we cannot survive. So our social mission of supporting Singapore musician has also become our business niche. And up to today, no matter what business we do, the festivals, the, the artist management, the music academy, the, the F&B outlets, everything is binded back to live music. Right, so we started it six years ago. Up to today, the same mission holds. You come to Timber, you see, we very proudly say that Timber is a home for Singapore musician. Almost all of our bands are Singapore, Singaporeans. And today, we, I believe most consumers regard Timber as the home for Singapore musicians. Yeah. So I think that's very much what we do. Uh, let me invite Viswa up on stage. How old are you? 27. 27? Yep. When did you think of becoming an entrepreneur? At what age? Six? I think. I never actually thought of being an entrepreneur, even now, uh, because it was really driven by ideas. And, and what drove me was, I have an idea, I just want to see it to fruition. Uh, and entrepreneurship was just one of those ways to get me there. Yeah. So I, until today, I don't really think of being an entrepreneur or think I am an entrepreneur. Well, modesty does go <laughs> places. Huh? The interesting thing about Edward is um, he was a pure science student then JC, pure science student. What were the subjects you did? Chemistry, physics, biology, maths. Okay. Yeah. Pure science. <laughs> pure science, as pure as it gets. And um, his option was to do medicine, right? Yep, yep. yep. And uh, your parents offered to send you to Boston. I, I was, I got a space in Boston. Uh, to do medicine? To, no, that time I already dis I've already decided, decided not to do medicine. Uh, only. This, I decided not to do medicine when I was in junior college. At the time I was actually had a medical attachment to Glen Eagles Hospital. Yeah. Okay. And because I realized that that is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah. But despite those experiences, some yeah. people still bite the dust. Right, Wink? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit late to change your course, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but let me ask you this, Edward. Yes. Are you an entrepreneur first? or a champion of this cause first? I mean, what drives you? I think what drives me is, is the, first and foremost, the social mission that we have, the cause that we really want to, uh, really as the topic says, find the soul of Singapore, in our small way, because we are not as big as the government or any ministry that we can say we really, in general, we want to find the soul of Singapore. But in our own niche and small way, by supporting Singapore music, I think that is part of what so the soul of Singapore is all about. So that is something which every day when we wake up, that is what drives us. Uh, of course, money is important, but I don't think if it was for money, I would have become a banker. You know, I would have probably become an investment banker and probably earn a lot more money than what we earn today. I guess what I'm driving at is, mm. as an entrepreneur, sometimes you come to crossroads yep. where you, there would be a significant amount of tension between the cause and the bottom line? Well, I Th think there would be. There would, well, first and foremost is what do you define as entrepreneurship? Yeah. Uh, so some people plainly define it as making money. Yeah. Uh, whereas I choose to define it as creating 
value for society in the media to long term. So when I sit down and I reflect and I say that is the definition, then there will come to a point of time where you say, is this a project that is worth supporting? Because it might lose money. And if I define it as just purely making money, it's obviously I'm not going to do this because it does not make money for us. But if I define it as creating value for society in the middle of the long term, then I take a look at the long term viability of why should I be supporting something like this. So if it does not make us lose so much money where our medium to long term future is at stake, then I say maybe I would support something like that. So it's not about the money, it's about value for society. Uh, so in that sense, when I look at certain things, I'm, I don't really get into conflict very much because mm. I'm quite at peace with myself. It's, if, if it really loses too much money and, and there's no long-term viability, I will not do it because there's really no value for society in the long term. Apart from value for society, yeah. it's also not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Right. So if there's not sustainable, there is no value for society in the medium to long term. So we do, when we do things, we look at, is it sustainable? Does it give value in the medium to long term? Because if it's not sustainable, we will not get there eventually. So we have a lot of businesses that is high risk. If I speak to a banker, and I have actually spoke to bankers about some of our, our businesses and they say, and the banker asks you, Edward, why do you do this? Because from a finance, from a pure financial analysis, you should not a, go there. we should not go there. Uh, we spend, sometimes we spend hundreds of thousands of millions to run a, a music festival that we had, that we featured Bob Dylan. From a, if I give the, the, the financial projections to a banker, they say you probably make more money by putting your money in a property or buying a property yeah. or speculating properties. But I think that's not our end game. Our end game is the cause. Our end game is provide value to society. But part of that also makes, makes me say to my team that we also need to have financial discipline. Because if the company goes bust, what value do we give to society in the medium and long term? We need to do well enough to survive, to grow, so that year on year we give more value to society. And year on year we can grow that cause. So there is a very nice balance. So, so now that we have established that and, mm. and you, you want to give back to society, yep. there are many ways you can do, you could have done it. There yes. are many areas you could have chosen. Mm. The question is, why did you choose this field, the arts, promoting the arts, mm. given the fact that number one, you did boring subjects in school. <laughs> number Doctors two, in the house might not agree. <laughs> and and worse, a worse sin is that you did well in those boring subjects. And third, <laughs> and third you had absolutely no direct exposure to music. I did. I did horribly because okay. I, my, I, was, I was born into a family. I had parents who were very traditional, put me through those classical piano. piano. I did my ABRSM. I think I even did up to grade five. And I had piano teachers telling me, you know, Edward, you should just give up because you're wasting your parents' money. So I did have my brush with the arts. Yeah, uh, but, but you but realized, I never, but I realized that you were lousy at it. I was lousy at practicing it. Okay. Right. So usually that's a put off. Usually that's a put off. And so, so why would someone who realizes that this is not your gig, mm. all right, because I found plunge that plunge right into it and say, I want to promote the arts? Well, I think it was back to my JC life. You know, yeah. uh, I was in a student council, and part of the job of the student council was to organize all of the school's main events. And it was really the, the, the enchantment of creating an event that really got me hooked onto it because the arts is something which. There is no boundaries. Unlike science, most of the time it's right is right, wrong is wrong. Whereas for the arts, it's subjective to the audience and to the practitioners. And I felt that that was something which I can create. I could expand my horizons and, and create something out of nothing. And that was what really got me into it and up to, to, up to now really drives me. But what was the turning point? Mm. I mean, given the fact that, I mean, what you're saying is it was the, the rush in organizing events yes. and organizing them well mm. that got you into this, mm. right? And along the way, arts became a possible cause, yes. right? Yes. Now, it's not the other way around, right? No, I think okay. it was so, more so of arts going to the events and then suddenly we realized there is a gap. Right. Uh, How old were you when this happened? I would say probably 19? 18, 19. 18? Okay. Yeah, so when that service. happened, you then, you then went on to create yes. an organization, right? Yes, Called so before, before Timber Group, I created a non-profit organization, uh, which was then called Arts for Us All, so in short, AFUA. Yeah. Um, and that was something which I, we got, I got other friends from other junior college. Back then, I think the legal age of creating a society or organization was still 21. <laughs> so we were young punks trying to create an organization and we got our parents to be proxies. 
So we really almost got our parents into trouble because every time IRS sends us a text notice, our parents got, <laughs> got afraid that we, we couldn't even fill the proper forms. Uh, so that was how it all started. And that time, it was because we were young, we were so idealistic, we thought the arts was something which a small organization like us can support. But along the way, you then realize the arts is so huge. You yeah. have dance, you have the perform, you have theatre, you have music. So h halfway through, I then realized that we have to choose our battles. We have to choose what do we really feel passionate about and want to support. Eventually, that was live music. And so, uh, how successful was Aqua? It was successful enough as a youth organization that we continue had interested youth volunteers to volunteer with us. Uh, but at some point, I felt that. I had to shut it down. I had to find uh, a location. So what drove us to start Timber was during the non-profit days, we had two challenges. One, for every event that we do, we have to raise funds through sponsorship. Yeah. For every event that we do, we have to look for new venues, like a new performance hall or, an, or like UCC or, or VT, VCH. So when Timber came about, I realized that these two obstacles would have been solved because I would have a physical venue that I could run live music concerts every day the F&B revenue would be then my revenue stream instead of relying on just ticket sales and sponsorship. Once again, as I said, that was when I was very young, yeah. 19, thinking that, wow, suddenly I found the, 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 the solution to all my problems at a non-profit level. Not knowing that now going into the commercial world is even hard because we were assuming that we were going to get the F&B yeah. revenue. So now that's when the next steep learning curve came that we had to make sure that we were actually a profitable company. So that and, was and, how and you have become fairly profitable. Your, your annual turnover is in the region um, of 10 million? Our group turnover to date would be at, in the region of 13 to 15 yeah. million. Excellent. Yeah. You know, excellent. Let's give yeah. it a hand. Yeah. Okay. In, in a very short space of time, yeah. you have demonstrated that you know, when you have the drive, the passion, the, the, you know, a cause that you want to fight for, you can actually reconcile some of those tensions and, and yes. differences. Yes. And, uh, a very quick question here, mm. uh, Edward. You said that you were doing fairly well in science yes. subjects. Yes. Uh, and then you decided to do economics and, and political, political science, science yeah. in the university. Uh, what made you make that switch to, to that? Well, in terms of, in terms of academics, I, I just felt that after a while, I kind of got bored with sciences. Mm. I wanted to try something new. Uh, and the social sciences was something which kind of interests me. Why I chose economics and political science is I felt that these are, and most people, might, some people might disagree with me, but I just felt that economics and politics is what really governs our daily lives. If you go and flip a newspaper today, more often than not, it's either a news that is linked to politics or it's a news that is linked to mm. economics. And it does help me with my present job, my present business, because in political science, you learn how to structure organization. And today we have 200 staff and we are constantly evolving, constantly growing and constantly reshuffling. So that discipline does help in, in my way of structuring uh, the organization. Economics, well, we are in business. So I think that is very much everything I look at we, we, it comes from a very economic perspective. One yeah. of our conversations um, that but one of the things that struck me in our mm. conversation was that you said, number one, you don't believe in school dropouts, dropping out of university, being a Bill Gates. At some point, it became fashionable to say, I'm a dropout, you know, <laughs> then I can succeed in, on, as an entrepreneur. I mean, you yeah. don't believe in that. You believe that you should really be serious about getting a good education, and it increases the chances of succeeding as an entrepreneur. Perhaps you could share a little bit of your perspective in that area. And secondly, a very quick one, is, you know, this, this whole thing about left brain, right brain. That's right. We have been brought up to believe that you're either a left brain or right brain, which has been debunked right now, that we, we are both left and right brain. And our education system, in the, especially in the, in the earlier days, uh, used to stream you towards science or the arts. They were mutually exclusive. You know, art students were told constantly reminded constantly that you shouldn't even attempt to count because you can't, you know, <laughs> and, and science students were told, don't bother to read, you know. So somehow when you are streamed very early in your life, yep. it limits your options in life. Right. But you sort of broke out of that. Uh, could, could I have your quick comments on these two aspects? 
Well, in terms of, of, of streaming, uh, we spoke about this, and, and I still fundamentally do not agree of the way we have streamed uh, our young people, our youths. I was fortunate because I, I kind of went into a stream that enabled me to do whatever I wanted in university. Yeah. Uh, and that was the reason why I probably chose the stream because when I went to JC, they told me you could go for triple science, you can do this, this, and then I asked a simple question. Do you do arts? If I do arts, can I then do science? No. Can I, if I do triple science, can I do arts? Yes. I said, okay, man. Why not? Yeah. I'll just go for triple science because when you're 17, 18, who the hell knows what you want to do in life? Yeah. So why do you want to close doors at such a young age? But that's the problem of our system because it kind of closes doors at a very young age for, 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 for the youth, you see. So, and, 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 and I said, sometimes people have this thinking that if you are left brain, right brain, you belong in certain things. But today I see so many engineers, doctors, who after a while cross, and they are great uh, producers, great supporter of the arts. And being involved in the arts does not mean you are a practitioner. Being involved in arts could also be a producer, a promoter, and being an administrator. And, and today, if you ask most of these arts organizations, they'll tell you a severe lack, a severe problem that a lot of organizations have is because they just do not have enough arts administrators. But are arts administrators left brain, right brain? Sometimes they are more left brain because you have to administrate the organization. But does it mean that they have no room to play in the arts? I think, I think no. I think they have a very strong role to play. So I think the problem with the system is it kind of typifies and says that okay, if you study this, then you become this. If you study this, you become that. And after a while, you're so socialized and you stop thinking, you put, and we put layers of glass ceiling above us that we do not see through that. And, and then it becomes very hard to find the soul of Singapore because everybody is trapped in their own individuality and they do not actually you know, socialize among each other. They don't actually appreciate each other, they don't actually respect each other. So you always have that tension between people who, who think they are left brain, people who think they are right brain, and they always have that tension meeting among themselves. But if people then realize that and appreciate different people and that you feel that I might be left or right, see, even when I say that, we are assuming there's left and right, right? but yeah. it, might not be, but it might not be the case. Mm. But it's all about us being a part of society, that you could actually help, you could actually support, and actually learn from each other. Great. And talking about Seoul of Singapore, I think we saw it last month in the GE. <laughs> um, all right, let's have questions, comments, but no speeches, please. Yes, please. Your name, where you come from, and your IC number. <laughs> <laughs> Yu King Jun's name, uh, NUS alumni. I'm asking this question because I don't get it. You know, uh, mm. Edward, you are so young, mm -hmm. you have no business training per se. I mean, politics. Political science and economics doesn't teach you how to run a business. And three, you've got into a business which is so competitive. You know, I know of so many failures of people who've gone into live music, bars, and so on. So what is it? I don't get it. You know, what is it that have made you so successful that you have not shared with us yet? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I see your grey hair. Uh, is this question born out of envy? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, Edward. Um, I think we, we, we were lucky, we were blessed, very much blessed of, of the times we started. When we, f when we first started in 2005, I think the concept of supporting Singapore music was very, was, was very appealing. Um, you are right to say that there are a lot of live music bars out there. You know? um, and I think a live music bar concept is not new. I think as long as the Irish have created Irish pubs hundreds of years ago, it is not a new concept. In any business, I believe that you need to find your own specialty and, and the niche. And the niche that we had was very much our social mission. So we're very lucky in the sense that while we are here to promote a social mission, it has also become our business niche and advantage. And that's and how we... And your differentiator. And, we are, and our differentiator. So the, the, no, no matter what we say, do we have a social mission or not, any business need to differentiate itself from the main market. And we were just very blessed because our social mission and it's the same thing that differentiates ourselves from the rest. Why we managed to grow is also because from an economic perspective, we made sure that no matter what we do, whatever outlets we go into, the first fixed cost is always kept very, very small, which is the rental. A lot of people who fail in this industry, 
gone in because they've, they've gone into shopping malls that, pay, that charges high rentals. Any brand requires a gestation period. And we also went through that gestation. We took two years to solidify our business. If we were slept with a very high rental, we would, I would not be here today because we would have been driven out of the marketplace. So there is a combination of, of, of finding a niche. It's also a combination a lot in terms of getting the right business discipline and continuing costs and growing organically. Some people get rush into it, they train, thinking that it, by throwing more money gets you high chance of success. Instead, sometimes it's the reverse. Sometimes it's better to be conservative in terms of investments and grow organically and, and making sure that at all times certain costs should be kept at a certain percentage. It was a steady growth, right? It was a steady years. growth. It was not like as if overnight we became like this. I think we took at least two years before we opened our second outlet. And I, I can tell you the first year was very demoralizing because we didn't really see um, a lot of success. I can remember the days where we, I was sitting down in the outlet and, and, and customers felt weird coming to the outlet because suddenly when they walk in, owners were looking at them and like, oh, saviors, because there was nobody else in the outlet. It's like, Is you are my first customers. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you coming? First customers of the day. So we went through all of that. And I think sometimes, I mean, I'm a firm believer in life there is something which we are not in control of, which is time. And everything takes time to grow. But what we are in control of is make sure that we survive to the time where we can eventually go to what I call the point of no return. But it takes a lot of effort to get us there to the point of no return. It's also it's always a, willingness drag, to, you know? a willingness to roll, roll up your sleeves yep. and do the hard work. Yep. And we, we were hands on. I think for us, I, we, I was in the rush. I was in the kitchen, I was in the bar, I was in the toilets doing every single a single thing of the business. So if I may continue, uh, being a social entrepreneur per se, mm -hmm. you know, do you have a, have you given enough thought to how much you're going to take out from the business and how much you're going to put back to, to grow and follow through your social costs? Well, I, I'll be honest with you. We have been around for six years and we haven't really taken back a lot of money into our own pockets in six years. We, for the past six years, we were on a very rapidly growth phase. So whatever we made in any of the existing business, we threw it back into investing in new ones, which is why today we, we could have about seven F&B outlets, we have two festivals, we have a music school. Uh, but it's also my firm belief that in any organization, there is a growth phase and then there's a consolidation phase and then the growth phase again. I would say right now we are at the beginning of our consolidation phase because we have shareholders and I can't keep telling shareholders that I need to grow, I need to grow. At some point of time, we need to give back to shareholders. And being, sometimes people ask me, what is the biggest thing an entrepreneur should do? What is the biggest social thing an entrepreneur should do? I say, one, take care of your shareholders. Second, take care of your people. Because that is the fundamental thing of, of starting a business. You create jobs and you need to return money to investors. And that's the first two things that we do. So I think we are at a phase now that we are, we, are, uh, we are moderating our growth. We are giving back more to our, our stakeholders and also giving more back to our staff as well. But also, I, I guess if I understand your question correctly, King Jun, mm. being a social enterprise, mm. uh, is there some sort of a foundation that you have so that a certain percentage of your Money. profits, after tax perhaps, that mm. are transferred? Well, do we... Do you have a, do you have a, a I, formula? I, 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 well, we, I, we are not a social enterprise. We are a private limited company. Uh, we run very much like a commercial company. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I like to, de to debunk certain things because sometimes people think having a corporate social responsibility means giving back money. Uh, I've, I actually feel that it's not about that. The greatest thing a, a company can do is not to make money from a commercial business and then take that money, take some percentage and give it to a social cause. The greatest thing is in that business itself is that business itself a social cause. Mm. Because then you don't need to talk about, do I take out some percentage to give here and there? Because if the whole business is revolves around a social mission, then it's fine. Because today there are so many intangibles. Today, I was yeah. sharing with yeah. you, we, we, we started because we wanted to develop Singapore music scene. And one of the key performance indicators we saw was, was the deliverables we saw was, a lot of musicians who started with us were part-time. They were moonlighting. They had to have two jobs, one day job and at night gigging. But now having developed themselves, they can now quit their day jobs and become professional musicians. And that for me is part of our success. 
But is that success quant uh, calculated by our profits we make? No. It's a success by what we have supported the industry on. Also, when, when you've chosen to manage some of these uh, fledgling groups, mm. right? That's part of your business equation. That's part of our business yes. equation. And so it's, it's not a separate foundation. No. I, I guess that's what you are driving at. So I, sometimes I, I felt that, you know, it's cleaner yeah. to just say I'm 100% total com commercial but with a social mission intent. Then to, op to start a, a non-profit or a foundation, and we all know that sometimes those foundations get into trouble due to corporate governance and, and all the legalities. And, and sometimes you just ask yourself, why do I want to get into such all of that? Mm. Why can't I just do it with 100% commercial backing? And I think that's the, 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 the path we chose to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Question, comment? Yes? My name is Valerie and I'm representing the online community who's watching Edward from their laptops or computers. Um, they're having a live chat right now and okay. actually it's pretty interesting what everybody's talking about. There seems to be two threads of um, conversation happening, and I'll ask you about the first one. Sure. That's about education. Mm. So, uh, it's your favorite topic. <laughs> so they were really interested, I think, in the first part of your talk, uh, where you talked about education. And backstage, Betty Thirteen asked, um, if you started the business um, as a student while mm. you were in still in school, mm -hmm. and it was so successful, why did you feel the need to finish your degree? Yeah. And um, oh, there were some follow-up questions about mm. education in the future and what okay. are your thoughts on okay. that? Yeah. I'll be honest, I'll be honest. When I first started the business, I, I obviously had to get the endorsement of my, my parents. <coughs> and it was a son-parent promise that I was not going to be a college dropout. That <laughs> okay. I was going to complete my degree and I'll show them a paper at the end of the day. Um, so that's the first thing that was a promise to my parents. Second, um, even without that promise, I felt that there was things that I was learning in, in, in NUS that was actually applicable to what I was doing in my business. The theories, the economic theories, the political theories does help me in shaping and analyzing. And I think the greatest thing education does is to help one analyze things better. Uh, sometimes people, business is all about being very hands-on. But at a certain stage, it also requires one to sit step back, back yeah. step back, look at the numbers, look at the structures, and do a complete analysis and ask and review whether it's the right direction we're going. And that is something which I believe education really helps on. All right. So there is two parts. There's education. There is also what we call practical knowledge, which unfortunately you can't really learn in a classroom format. You have to get your hands dirty, get down, and do it. But I believe what really makes a difference between whether we grow to a, a $5 million company, $50 million or $100 million company is the education part really. Because at some point, you cannot be that hands-on. Really. You have to take a step back and you have many different layers of structures. And that's where the academic, uh, I believe the academic theories really helps in, in the way we structure I things. guess what underpins that question is mm. uh, the concept of opportunity cost, right? Yes. Now, I mean, if you are in your first year, mm. And you, and you started your enterprise, and the enterprise seems to be taking off. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the opportunity cost of devoting 100% of your time there mm -hmm. and growing it faster versus completing your degree. I, I think that's what they're driving mm -hmm. at. You know? Because I, I've met some individuals who have actually chosen in the, not to do the honors, mm -hmm. yeah, drop out of school, you know, and initially they thought of doing it as a gap year start something and then it took off but they never came back to study and uh, some of them have no regrets yes because they said if i had gone back i would have lost momentum in building my company so i guess that's that's the dilemma that some individuals have well you see the opportunity costs can be calculated in so many ways on this hand the opportunity cost would be if if i study then am i giving up on the growth opportunities of the company if you take a flip side is if i don't study can i bring my company to the next stage because I might have, have learned something that enabled me to bring my company to the next stage. So there's, there's, there's many... So the question here is, what is it specifically, I'm not very mm. clear, mm. what is it specifically that you acquired in year two, three, and honours year that has put you in much better stead today as an entrepreneur? I mean, you, you said some economic foundations, mm. which well, one I could argue you can, you can even learn on your own. You can pick it up as you go. Uh, like for example, King Jun, uh, you did chemistry, right? 
he, he, the first, his first exposure to economics was as a mature student doing his MBA. First exposure to economics. But did that set you back before that? Your lack of exposure to economics. Yep. So it is still possible. What I'm, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it is not impossible for you to take that path. Yes. So I'm challenging you. Yes. How would you substantiate your argument? Well, it's true that, that if you go through the, the school of hard knocks, you will get there eventually. Uh, but the word is eventually. Uh, because I feel that there are certain things that you could, you could be much faster. You can get a grapple of, 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 of things much faster if you have an academic foundation of certain theories. That even helps you in the school of hard knocks. Because in the school of hard knocks, you either learn it faster or slower. I choose to believe that if one has, has a basic academic uh, uh, grounding, it actually even helps one learn faster in the school of hard knocks. Because I have the basics, and when I see certain things, I like, realize I pick it up much faster, I analyze it much faster, I can apply it much faster. So that is why I still believe that, that one should still have a basic uh, academic foundation. Am I going to take my MBA? Probably not. right? Because then really the opportunity cost is really much bigger. But I chose to feel that when I'm still in undergraduate study, the opportunity cost is not that great yet. I have the opportunity. So many people do not even have the opportunity to go to university, and I had it. Yeah. I should make full use of it. And I'm, I'm kind of those people that if I start something, I don't want to stop as well. I want to complete it. So your point is front-loading education. Yes. So that your opportunity cost is actually reduced. Because the opportunity cost will only get bigger, yeah. yes, larger, you. as you get Absolutely. more developed and older. So Sometimes I, I speak to, 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 to friends and, I sit and they ask, why did I start at 21 years old to start a company? I said, it's precisely because of opportunity cost. Because if I chose to start a business when I'm in my 30s or 40s, I would have a wife, I might have children. And if I have failed, I would have put wife and kids all the way down. But at 21, if I have failed, it's just me. And I still had a lot of time to regain my footing and start all over again. So you've thought it all. <laughs> and all this while you made it sound it's all spontaneous. <laughs> Next question. One more question before okay, we throw uh, it back. Great. Okay, so the other like train of conversation mm. was happening around uh, the local music scene in Singapore. Ah. And I think we've got quite a few Very music, debatable. music fans here. Mm. And uh, I think while they agreed that it was up and coming and vibrant, I yes. think there was a strong uh, belief that uh, like there was a mindset against local music. Like, you know, people would, one of our um, commenters said that people would pay $200 to see Kylie Minogue in concert, but oh, right, not right pay now. $50 to see the local, uh, local play in the mm, theater. Mm. So how does Timber deal with that, um, with that mindset? Yeah. I think uh, mindsets are really hard to change. Uh, you can't change mindsets overnight. Um, and I think, is there, is, my question is, is there anything wrong of paying $200 to watch, to watch Kylie Minogue? I don't think there is, because she is successful in her own right. She really became world famous. She worked on her craft when she was very young. And if you go back to Australia, she is a local musician there, right? And she's better looking than Bob Dylan. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Even at far close range, you can't, you can't do All right, so the, the matter here is not about is it local or is it not local or is it foreign? It's, bet it's a matter of quality. So I think I, I really don't like to get stuck in the argument of local or not local. Because our message to Singapore musicians is that, look, if you are not good enough, you are not good enough. Work on your craft, get better at it. Because you cannot keep thinking that people must support you because you're Singaporean or you're local. Because you need to get to a certain level before someone supports you. So even at Timber, we have a very high level of what we call QC. If we feel a Singapore band is not good enough, we will not put them on stage. Although we say yes, 100% Singapore band, but what we choose to do is we make sure we get the best of Singapore music up on stage because it only does justice to the entire music scene. So it's not about do we support or not support because I think at a very basic level, any audience, any consumers, the fundamental thing that they pay for is quality. Not whether is it Singaporean or is it international. And every international star, stars are local from their home country. But they got f off from that scene and they became international. Why? Because of quality. Right. And uh, so, so you're drawing a distinction between patronage and 
patronizing. Yeah. And, and sometimes you could end up patronizing your local and groups. And, yeah, because after a while, if you're just supporting for the sake of supporting, and say because I'm supporting because of Singapore, it, musician, it is once again not sustainable because yeah. the interest after a while were wear off. Okay. All right. What would constantly... Do you feel that our, our local musicians groups, mm. uh, are there groups that you've met who, who seem to have, for lack of a better word, uh, a crutch mentality? Well, I think there are, uh, there, there are some. I think there are also some who are very good. And some, sometimes, I tell you, we get very frustrated because when we, we have some new bands and some younger bands that we are trying out, mm. they go on stage, they plug in their guitars, and I tell you, before they even perform their song, I get literally angry because they have not even tuned their own guitar. So tell me, if you don't even have the discipline to tune your own guitar, what makes you deserving of that stage opportunity? Because if people are paying to watch you perform, the band perform, the band then has to give back to the people that pay to watch them perform. Yeah. And they must have that, that, that foundation and the basics. So we are sometimes very tough. To be honest with you, when we, when we speak to musicians, we give them the hard truth. Yeah. We tell them this is not an easy industry, it's a very tough industry. To begin with, we, we are not very nationalistic to begin with, like what you say, supporting our own single world. So we are already up huge stream. But what will change mindsets, what would then change people to say, hey, wow, I didn't know Singapore bands could be this good. It's precisely of your, in, your individual craft, your, your actual quality. Excellent. I, yeah. I'm sure your comments would be generating a lot of online reactions, not just responses. Yeah. Okay. Could we have some comments or questions, anything? From the audience. Uh, please don't pretend to be dumbstruck. Yeah. Yes, please. I, I just want to know whether you have any method or some expert in spotting talent. Because you see some people and you talk to them, by one or two sentences, you will know whether this fellow has talent. Do you have this sort of person in your outfit? What kind Do you of have talent? Any method or software and everything to find out the potential of the person. What kind of talent? Musical talent? Musical or? Musical talent, no. Oh, obviously, we, can't, we, cannot, we cannot know if someone has musical talent if just by talking to them. We have to see. Well, there will be some musicians where... Uh, let me just, just relate to you an uh, experience that we had. I, I was up in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, uh, scouting for... Because we have, we have uh, ambitions to go regional. And, and I was at this nice little bar called No Black Tie. Mm. Uh, for those who know their music in KL, they know this nice little queen bar called Further. No Black Tie. And we were there for dinner, and the musician for the night was just on stage doing their sound, his sound check. And just by hearing him doing his sound check, we knew that he was a gem. Uh, he, and, and he's not Singaporean, he was Malaysian, but just by hearing sound checks, sometimes we can pick up things very quickly. And then we invited him to perform in Timber in Singapore. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes the, the, they are like raw diamonds. You need to actually, they might not sound good firsthand. Um, so that's where we look at. What, what we actually look at is not talent. So some people are already so polished. So even at a sound check, we know they are good. But what we actually really look at is what I call attitude. Is the musician mm. Mm. humble enough, willing to learn, willing to take advice, willing to, to uh, discipline enough to even tune their own guitars? for example. So what we always look at is attitude, more than talent. Because one can be very talented, but with the wrong attitude, it's not going to get anywhere. That's my fundamental uh, belief. Not just in musicians, but in our own uh, marketing teams, our own staff as well. You know, uh, just to pick up from that point of attitude yeah. versus talent, uh, a friend of mine who, who runs a global company, who is American, he told me, made this comment recently to me, and he said, um, the problem with Singapore, Singapore-based companies, <coughs> is not talent, it's attitude. The reason why many Singapore-based companies that may have very attractive bottom line, who still will not make the mark as a global, truly global, iconic companies, is because there's no attitude. He used the word attitude, which attitude. is why what you said struck a chord mm. with me. Mm. Uh, what do you think he meant, and uh, how does it relate to your idea? Well, for me, back to your favorite topic of education, uh, I think the, 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 the biggest thing my parents gave me was not basic education. It, it was attitude. 
the attitude to believe that anything can actually be achieved. So what I, I infer from that is maybe he felt that Singapore companies had glass ceilings over them. They mm. just don't psychological think glass. Psycho psychological glass ceilings that they think that this is the best I can do. I'm happy with my bottom line and this is where I think I can go. Uh, but I might not have the belief to say that you know, I can do better, I can break out of Singapore, I can, do, I can eventually become an uh, international organization with offices all over the world. Uh, that's something which I believe a lot of Singapore companies have, have kind of not got out of yet. Yeah. And the belief, the belief, yeah, to the, be the belief, the self-efficacy, yeah. you know, and I, I think there is something to be said about that. In, in the field of the arts, music mm. specifically, do you, have you spotted an individual group or an individual, a, a group or an individual who seem to have that attitude plus talent mm -hmm. that has, that gives them the chance or gives him the chance to be a player in the global stage at some point. H have you met someone like that who seems to have that spark, that X factor? Well, you know, it depends once again what we define by international stage because today a lot of what we define as international stage you, means to say you have to be uh, English pop icon like Kylie Minogue or Bob Dylan. Uh, but to, it's Asia's time. I believe it's Asia's time. And I see we have already a lot of Singaporeans who have already broke out of Singapore. Stephanie Sun. Stephanie Sun, Kit Chan. JJ Lin, who are actually all very much English no, speaking. I'm saying, okay, to, to, to push yeah. the boundaries a little bit more, I'm saying in the English. Scene, English. It's a lot more difficult. It's a lot more difficult. Right? But do you, have you spotted anyone who seemed to have that X factor? I think we, we have. I think we have a band uh, in Timber whom we are managing ourselves uh, who, who does have the desire, a lot of self belief, borderline cockiness, okay. which sometimes I like. Because I think when, when, when one is young, the belief and cockiness sometimes is a fine line. Yeah. Um, the challenge for them now is that they have a, they have a local uh, gathering, uh, following. I mean, the band I'm talking about is, is Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Mm. So Goodfellas, when they perform at Timber, it's always packed. No matter what night, we give them a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, people come to watch the Goodfellas. They have the self-belief. They are appealing enough I believe to a international audience. The challenge for them right now is whether they have the creativity and the desire and the determination to write their own material. Because to break into the international scene, you can't be singing other people's songs. You can't be a cover band. You need to write your own material, write your own song, and perform your own song, and that's where you really live to the next stage. So we have spoken to the band, we said that really the next stage of your development is to go back to the drawing boards, be real musicians, write your own song, practice it, we don't believe in cutting CD albums. Put it on, on YouTube, get famous that way, and then tour, tour, the, tour the region. Will Timber be able to handhold them to a point before they take off? Yes, I would say, as I mentioned just now, I was in Kuala Lumpur uh, for a reason because uh, we feel that we, we have supported Singapore musicians to one stage where we have presented them in Singapore. For Singapore musicians to then go to the next stage, it's not so much about developing them in Singapore anymore, but developing them in other markets, within Southeast Asia, for example. Why we see so much need, and re once again reinvesting uh, our money into growth in the region is because if timber grows, in, let's say in, in Malaysia or in Thailand or Indonesia, we not only go there as a business, we go there with our musicians. By, that, by doing that, we also help our musicians open up new markets, new audience, and help them grow bit by bit. We don't want to talk about international. I think one needs to be a bit more grounded and say, before we even talk about international market, let's conquer our region, Southeast Asia. Immediate first. region. The immediate region. So I think when we grow as a business, we will never forget that our social mission is to support Singapore musicians. Yeah. We will bring our Singapore musicians along with them. So that is how much I believe we can handhold them. But at the end of the day, it would be very embarrassing if I bring a Singapore band to Malaysia to perform, ends up singing a Coldplay song or sing, singing uh, uh, another, another yeah. song. So we told them that before, this is, we, we actually sit down with musicians, we actually even share with the musicians 
our entire business growth strategy. And we explain why we are doing this, and we say we want to bring you along. But while we do our part, the musician must do their part by writing original materials. Because if they don't write their own song, we cannot say this is Singapore music. Right. Yeah. OK. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan, and I'm a postgraduate student with my chemical engineering. OK, um, you mentioned about education and basically opportunity cost. Well, uh, I actually like to understand from you, what is, it, what is the one biggest barrier for stopping you from stepping out even earlier? Was it really education? Because I do see a lot of friends, including um, myself sometimes, I mean, you know, you know um, about having uh, the desire for more greater education in terms of maybe in terms of finance or economics or even management before we even, even step out. On the other hand, there are people who have been working for years, they want to start up their own business. And it's the one thing about uh, not knowing that is actually stopping them. What would you have to say to them? Well, I think this goes back to belief. Uh, there is, I, I fundamentally believe that there's not, one, you need to have your own belief, that to step into unknown territories because there is never a situation where you know about everything. Uh, business is something which you can never know about everything. And it's fast changing, it's, it's, it's fluid. Uh, so it's not so much about education or how much you know, but more of whether you have the courage or, or the drive to really say, you know, I want to do something like this and I'm willing to go into it, go through hard knocks. At any point of turn, I'm, I'm going to find a solution to it. So it's beyond, I, I actually feel it's beyond education. Actually, It because goes back to the, the attitude, attitude point that you're talking really, about. Because at what point do you say you're educated enough? At what point do you say you're not educated enough? Uh, people have different people have different opinions about that. But the, the, the simple thing is taking the first step and just getting it done. Just do it. Yeah, but that his is point is education at a basic level, mm -hmm. which is a, a degree, mm -hmm. is today considered a basic level education is what you should try and complete. Yes. But beyond that, whether you want to do your postgraduate, your second PhD, I mean, that's really up to you. I think it's you. an individual choice. You know, uh, between that and yeah, entrepreneurship. Yeah. It's an and, and I also know that a lot of entrepreneurs today are also going back to school. Yeah. Right? Uh, so there is never a black or white because entrepreneurs have grown their business to a certain stage. They also decide that maybe I should go back to school and learn something and that will help me yeah. in growing the business. You stage. see, in, in many ways, in many parts of uh, USA, for example, they have this revolving door syndrome, right? Where the, 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 the door revolves, you go into the industry, you come back, you upgrade yourself, mm. you go for shorter modules, courses, and then you go back to the industry. Sometimes you come back to teach as an adjunct. Mm. So th in many societies, mature societies, you have a revolving door mm. concept, you know? So maybe that's that, another that, that way. That's probably the problem in Singapore because maybe that concept is not mature, mature enough. enough. Yeah. Where we have the vice provost here. Do you have a comment on this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, later. Uh, I love putting you people in the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sorry, has he answered the question? Yes, sir. yes definitely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? We're running a bit out of Yes, please. So how's the songwriting coming along for your musicians? Sorry, I uh, cannot play cheat. What's your name? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm Ning. I'm not actually an alumni person. I'm, I came with somebody who actually works at NUS. Okay. I came because I think this is an interesting topic. What I found quite surprising, though, is that a lot of conversations ended up being about your entrepreneurial you know, ventures and education. Oh. Yeah. So um, I think for me, I just wanted to find out about your musicians and how that's going as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some of our musicians have actually penned their own songs. Uh, one of our bands that perform with us, also a very popular band, is this band called 53A. Started out as a cover band. Until today, they are also a cover band. But I think at some point last year, they, 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 they penned their own songs and they created their first EP and they have their nice album now. So I think I do see encouraging trends. Some, most of our bands today have their own songs, their own materials. Uh, the band that I was talking about, Goodfellas, I believe they are already writing their own songs. Uh, so I think we are pushing them in the right direction. It takes time. You know? it's, unfortunately, music and the arts is not something like, like you go into a factory and you make a, a can, canned food and then ta -ta, canned food appears. It requires some time, it requires inspiration, 
And a lot of musicians write better songs when they are heartbroken, so they have to go through life experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so they go through life experiences. Um, and it's really, you know, if you go down to basic fundamentals of songwriting, it's writing about one's emotions. So these are things that we can't rush. We really can't rush them to do so, uh, into it. Uh, but what we can do is to say that, hey, you better start doing something about it. But take your time, find your inspiration. And I think we are, we are saying, right, so we have bands who have already have started their, uh, writing their own songs. Yes. Uh, you don't have to stand up, sir. <laughs> yeah. My name is Sandy Singh, alumnus, 1965. Wow. So that was, you didn't dye your hair. Sorry, sorry, okay. <laughs> to what extent is the uh, tax regime hinder you from extending your life show? To go to a cinema like this one, it costs you $9. But the live show usually started with at least $28, $35, $45 like that. So can we appeal to government to reduce the entertainment duty, which I think is very healthy. So do you think you can expand on this? Is there, on, on is what there, the government should is do there entertainment tax? Uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. aware there is entertainment there is. tax actually. There is? <coughs> there is, is it, Jeremy? Is there is? What's the percentage? Oh, we don't know. There is a tax. There is a, okay. Well, from what I know, we have not been taxed. So you have, you have not been paying your tax? <laughs> okay, you so sure you want to... You've just gotten us into to trouble. Okay, can, can we please... <laughs> No, no, no. I think what you're referring to, I think what you're referring to is licenses and copyright, copyright stuff. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, that is something which is not tax. That's more of a copyright license. Right, so when you say tax, I get nervous, you know, because I start wondering, GST, are you talking GST, corporate tax? Because we do, of course, pay uh, what we call copyright license to an organization called Compass. Yeah, that's, who, who that's supports, different. Who supports... Uh, songwriters to true royalties. Um, I do not believe that is what is pushing up uh, ticket prices, to be honest with you. That is not what's, what is really pushing up uh, ticket prices because it's very hard to compare a live concert to a movie ticket because at the end of the day, a movie ticket is about factory production. It's economies of scale. You get to be able to edit. It's manufactured. It's manufactured at the end, and the whole idea of Watching a movie in a cinema is so that the end consumer pays route less because you have economies of scale. But the movie started because of theatre. If there's no theatre, there's no movies, right? So theatre today will still cost a lot because it's, it, we just do not have the economies of scale to go into mass production. So it's not a tax issue nor a license issue. It's very much the nature of the business that a live, live act or a live concert just does not have the same economies of scale as a manufactured uh, movie pass. Yeah. So it's not about tax and... Okay, let's quickly veer yeah. that away from... So that because we want you to continue to be a businessman. <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> uh, and not go bust or, or just disappear suddenly. Uh, Val, is there anything, any interesting development online? Nothing? Okay. All right. So I have the liberty of asking you, the privilege of asking yes. you the last question. Of all local talent over the years, right, who do you think, or which group do you think, has been the most successful? When you say over the years, when you say how long back do say you want to talk about? 20 years? Because well, some are you quite, already, uh, you some people here are about 20, so you know, let's not go. You're really putting me on a spot. No, just now. anyone, anyone that comes to your mind, which is, which comes close to really successful. Someone you admire, someone you okay, think. I think could someone who I, I, I think has done well, uh, not just uh, for herself. Uh, will be, I mean, the name that springs to my mind is someone like Kit Chan. Kit Chan. Uh, why I say Kit was because I really think that she was the first to really break out in the Singapore market and really got into the Taiwanese market, and 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 really spearheaded that for many other Singapore musicians to go into that market. So she might not be, she might not have been as big as today's JJ Lin. Yeah. But I think I credit her for really being one of the first few. A trailblazer. A trailblazer mm. that was the guiding light for the rest of our Singapore musicians that really said, hey, look, it is possible, I'm, I'm going to do it, and I've done it. Do you have a sense of what made her do it? 
Because I, I remember it, yeah. it was uncharted territory. It was uncharted territory. You know, I think what made her do best, it. Back, to, back to what... Because she, she went to the Singapore education system. She went yeah. to RGS as Singapore as you can be, right? Uh, <laughs> are there any RGS girls here? You know? No. Quite straight-laced. Yes. Went there. Yes. But then she managed to break out of the stereotype and do something that is different. I, I think, what made it, I think it goes back to what the main thing I, wanted, uh, I was saying today. She had belief. She believed it was possible. She believed she had the, the talent. She believed she had the right business context, the right opportunity. She believed it was the right time, and she did it. So it was not about her our refugian education, but I really think it's her self-confidence and belief that made her do it. Well, we'll stop it here for now. Uh, I'd like you to join me in saying a big thank you and good luck to this man. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's, it's always wonderful. It's heartwarming and it's, it's really wonderful to see one of our own go out there and just do it. You know, just do it. And, and what comes through today is your, your quiet confidence and your sophisticated charisma. <laughs> I wonder is that good or bad? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have something for you. Thank you. Thank you. You see, what we, is fast? You see, this is the photograph of you and I. Okay, that was very see, fast. We, we work very fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a souvenir. Thank you. For you. Thank you very right? much. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Another round, please. Thank you. Thank you. And there's something else. Now, this is, this is from you to us. Okay. Uh, we just need you to okay. say something nice about us here. Okay. Uh, legibly, if you can. Okay. You know, and, uh, and then we'll keep it. And when you really make it big, <laughs> we will sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Now I see how you get your ROI and, and of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. But you're taking a huge risk with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so two liners uh, will be right? two liners, one line. Okay. Well, but but it has to be something nice. I'll just do one word. <laughs> yeah, I'll just do one word. Believe. You sure that's a signature? Yeah. Did you see a signature? <laughs> yeah. can, can you show it to them? <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can just put it on the side. All right. Uh, what's going to happen now is we're going to have, we're going to move out and uh, there's some snacks. And then those of you who want to have a more in-depth chat with Edward uh, for another half an hour or so, you know, please stay back. And Edward has kindly agreed to sit down and chat more about any of the areas that you didn't get a chance to hear about. All right? Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's You Are Live session. If you wish to continue the discussion with Mr. Cha, there will be an additional discussion held from 8.45 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. at Seminar Room 2. If you wish to nominate a future speaker, you may do so on the feedback forms given to you earlier. Additional forms are available at the registration table. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next Your Live session.